Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hi guys, okay. Um, preemptive like, Sweeney. Uh, he'll have ads. Make sure to use all the slash Sweeney. My name's Connor. Hello, I like to learn things. I really want to learn about Italy. Or not, uh, learning, that's misleading. I want to learn about what happened on the Italian peninsula post Justin, post Roman Empire, post West, you know, post Justinian, uh, like 900 all the way up. But I'm, I really want to focus on like not year 900, maybe 800 to 1400 right now, I think would be good. But, but I, I, that's just coming off the top of my head. Anyways, I'm excited. Great channel. Grand of like. Did I say my name's Connor? I'm all over the place. Original link to the video, top of the description, right under that link to the Discord. Click on it. Send right over there. Love to have you. I've had too much coffee. I can tell by how fast I'm talking. Okay, let's go. This episode is sponsored by Squarespace and is part of Operation Odysseus, the largest collaboration of history channels on YouTube. Today, 17 other fantastic YouTube channels have released a video on this collaboration on naval history, a playlist of which can be found in a link below. After 24 years spent in the court of Kublai Khan, 4K Khan in China. After 24 years spent in the court of Kublai Khan in China, an aged and immeasurably wealthy Marco Polo returns to his native homeland in Venice. He finds the city's martial banner raised, with St. Mark's lion holding a sword instead of a Bible. Venice is at war. Polo is captured by the enemy, Genoa, and from his prison cell, he writes of his adventures in the Far East. Yeah, that's so... So he went away, came back, was like, hey guys, I'm back. Only to just get arrested right away. And um, obviously, hard to put yourself into that time with that communication. I have to stop talking. One of the best intros. Italian history cannot be fully understood without talking about the maritime republics whose contribution to the economy and politics of the Italian peninsula was almost immeasurable. Chief among them were the megalithic trade rivals Genoa and Venice. And here to help me talk a bit about this topic is Blue from Overly Sarcastic Productions. Say hi Blue. Hey everyone and thank you James for having me on the channel. Although I have to ask, where's my mouth? No problem at all, can't wait to get started. And sweet Viennese pastries, what happened to my arms? Blue will also be doing a video on Venice and how it became an unrivaled maritime power. Come to think of it, I'm not really sure how I got here. But why is everything so colorful? James, I'm freaking out, man. Please be sure to check out his video all about Venetian history if you haven't already done so. The city-states of Italy see if this video I were birthed by warfare. The struggle between the Byzantines and the Lombards for control of Italy meant that the coastal trade cities were left to fend for themselves more often than not, building high walls to protect them from mainland armies and large navies to protect their trade networks from Muslim and Saracen pirates. The Byzantines granted self-governing status to Amalfi, Gaeta, Venezia, Ancona, and also eventually Ragusa, while the Holy Roman Empire did the same. I want to screenshot this so I can, or I'll just like go I'll wave my hand so... I know when to, so I can come back and look up these later. Okay, I took a screenshot. All right, sorry, this not the best start. I'm, I'm ready. No more pausing. An empire did the same for the cities Maybe. of Genova and Pisa. War is not good for business, so overland trade routes were pretty much defunct at this point, allowing for the growth and prosperity of the ocean-going trade routes. You'll remember from the previous episode that warfare was so widespread that it even features in the founding legend of Venice. These cities were called republics because they elected their leaders, such as the Doge, Italian for Duke, who was usually under large influence by the aristocratic merchant families. As time wore on, two of these republics would come to dominate their rivals for trade on either side of the peninsula, Genoa Venice. and Venice.
Nice. Now, Venice was of particular importance to Italy as this floating city water fortress became filthy rich with trade as well as with her exploits during the Crusades to the Holy Land. But if you're wondering how this tiny speck of islands hey. became so fabulously wealthy in the first place, then we've got to talk about the unique brand of mercantilism that Venice was famous for, and it comes down to three main factors. The first is geography, as Venice and Genoa sat at the far northern edge of the Mediterranean, meaning they could get goods far into Europe without breaking the bank on slow, expensive, and dangerous overland transit. The Makes added sense. benefit to Venice here is that they were able to dominate the narrow Adriatic Sea, whereas Genoa was just facing out into the open Mediterranean. By controlling those waterways, Venice took nearly half of Italy out of competition. The second factor is trade partnerships, as Venice ends to a lesser extent. Yeah, what is that, like 100 miles or something? Between uh, the heel of the boot and Greece? I see you all have a scuffle going on, but can I interest anyone in some silks, spices, perhaps, mayhaps? Genoa too was tolerant and cooperative with merchants in the Muslim world even during the Crusades. In addition to that, since Venice was a direct offshoot of the Byzantine Empire, the two were buddy-buddy from the very start. Genoa also had these relationships, but it always played second fiddle because it was smack in the middle of major European powers and all of the wars they fought with each other, making Venice the safer option to bet on with regards to trade. The last factor, and the one that really puts it over the edge for Venice, was their government. Even though both cities were run by a republic, it's a classic case of market economy versus command economy where either private or state parties determine how the economy will function and who benefits most. Macroeconomics 101 finally coming in handy. Genoa's economy operated through private merchants and banks, whereas Venetian commerce was coordinated by the government itself. But here's the kicker. The Grand Council was overwhelmingly made up of merchants, so when the state dictated travel itineraries and shipping manifests, or subsidized the construction of a public merchant fleet, it all worked because everyone knew what they needed to succeed. And on a more individual level, the government provided loans for up-and-coming merchants as well as commerce insurance. It's honestly a little shocking how many modern sounding instruments of economics and trade were invented by the Venetians in the Middle Ages. Sounds so like if we look at the whole picture, Genoa fell just short of Venice in the cases of geography and partnerships, but on the subject of government, the Venetians blew Genoa right out of the water. At every step, Venice works together to achieve an unfathomable level of economic efficiency. It's no mistake that 50 years after the last Venetian Genoese war, Venice looked like this while Genoa got eaten by the Holy Roman Empire, okay? At every I, I, I want to read, but then again, I'm, I'm pausing in between the talking, and I know that it's hard to please both. Step, Venice works together to achieve an unfathomable level of economic efficiency. From this, it's easy to see why these two cities arose as the powerhouses they did, and why Venice went on to become the unchallenged economic champion of the coming renaissance. Hey, thanks for your help, Is that Blue. where Columbus Anytime. was from? Talking about all this Venetian history helps justify those years of suffering in economics classes. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go um, find my arms. Later! So why are Genoa and Venice so important to understanding Italian history? Firstly, they became the economic powerhouse of the Eastern and Western Mediterranean, respectively, subsuming the influence of the other republics until they eventually were butting heads with each other. They were also the go-to shipbuilders for crusaders, meaning they had a huge impact on the campaigns to the Holy Land, only further expanding their influence. The trade networks were so vast that it is thought that the Genoese trading station of Caffa brought the Black Death to Europe on the rats that lived in the hulls of merchant ships. There are so many different theories on how it was brought over. Uh, the Venetians are going to have a hard time with uh, Austria, though, when it becomes a thing. Aust Genoese bankers became the most elite in Europe and even became a pawn for the ambitions of other states for control over Italy, including most famously the House of Aragon and France. Arguably the most famous Genoan was Cristoforo Colombo, hey. a sailor and navigator who pioneered the use of a navigation technique called Dead Reckoning to try and find a western route to India, eventually discovering the New World, previously unknown to Europeans. Venice, on the other hand, had fared much better in the Middle Ages. The Venetian merchants agreed to participate in the Fourth Crusade, which ended up never reaching the Holy Land and getting disastrously involved in a Byzantine succession crisis. But after not getting paid by the broke Byzantine <laughs> Empire, the Crusaders and Venetians sacked the city of Constantinople and divided the empire into a series of successor states, with Venice being awarded many new colonies in the Aegean. Their continued presence in Greece allowed them to become the main connection between Europe and the Middle East, which set up the highway for intellectual migration of ancient Greek humans. Oh, oh, oh. 
Empire, the Crusaders and Venetians sacked the city of Constantinople and divided the empire into a series of successive Venetians sacked. So, but, so. but after not getting paid by the broke Byzantine Empire, the Crusaders and Venetians sacked the city of Constantinople okay. and divided the empire into a series of successor states, with Venice being awarded many new colonies in the Aegean. Their continued presence in Greece allowed them to become the main connection between Europe and the Middle East, which set up the highway for intellectual migration of ancient Greek humanism that would lead to the Renaissance. Okay, the reason I was confused is because I, I didn't know if he just said that Venice got control over Constantinople, but it, it got a lot of posts in the Aegean. Okay. These trade routes were largely kept open when Constantinople fell to the Ottomans, and the Italian city-states started taking in thousands of intellectual refugees from the formerly Roman territory. These very important links would help birth the Enlightenment as Venetians established connections with Persian and Arabic scholars and scientists, something that was sorely lacking during the previous centuries of crusading zeal. The growth of the Ottoman Empire eventually led to the Venetian monopoly on a lucrative spice trade in the Far East, which would directly result in the stimulus for the Dutch, Portuguese and Spanish to seek new routes to India and the accidental discovery of the New World. Between 1256 and 1381, the Genoese and the Venetians had fought four separate wars for trade dominance, usually involving the crumbling Byzantine Empire. The Between 1256 and 1381, the Genoese and the Venetians had fought four separate wars for trade dominance, usually involving the crumbling Byzantine Empire. The dominance of these republics would eventually come to an end when the Atlantic powers basically put them out of business, but also during the period of the Thirty Years' War and the Italian Wars, which effectively destroyed mainland markets. Italian Wars. Especially for Venice. As said before, war is not usually good for business. Venice and Genoa would both be abolished during the French Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars. Sometimes it is good, right? and Genoa would both be abolished during the French Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars, when they became dominated by the rising European powers of France and Austria in 1797. This video is part of Operation Odysseus, and you can find a playlist linked to Blue's video on overly sarcastic productions on screen now, or you can keep on the lookout for this banner on your favorite YouTube history channels to check out this awesome 17 channel collaboration. Guys, make sure squarespace.com slash Sweeney if you do it. Awesome. Amazing. Amazing. I feel like I've had a lot of these uh, history videos in the past few days that have been huge. Uh, what I call fog, uh, fog of war clearers. Like connecting certain things around Europe so that I can kind of understand European history. You know, I'm, I'm trying to from, you know, Alexander the Great up until modern day and... I'm not saying I, I plan to be an expert anytime soon in any ind individual area, but I'd like to, my big goal is to be able to, to think about history and mainly European history, and I'll get to other areas of the world, in a somewhat coherent manner over the, you know, like I said, Alexander the Great to modern day. And Italy was one of those big things that I thought was lacking in a lot of what I was learning. And this is a great fill-in, despite it just being 10 minutes long. And, you know, an animated, you know, fun video. Awesome. Hope you're all doing well. Hope you learned something or can teach me something in the comments. If you're not doing well, don't worry. You'll be good soon. All right. See you guys next time.